Um, welcome everyone to this um, special MRL seminar. Um, so our speaker today is uh, Dr. Marcus Wagner. Um, we're actually collaborators from the past um, when you were still in Berlin, right? So you did your yeah. PhD at the Technical University in Berlin. Yeah. That's when we collaborated on uh, oxide materials. I think you will have a few slides on that. Mm, not really. I kicked not them really. out. <laughs> <laughs> Fair but, enough. But there, is there will be some oxides in, it, in the talk. I think that's almost 10 years ago, no? Exactly. Uh, um, <laughs> and then in 20. 10, no, 2011, he accepted a position as a lecturer and postdoc in Sydney, Australia. Yeah. And then ever since 2012, he was in uh, Barcelona in the Phononic and Photonic Nanostructure Group at the Catalan Institute of uh, Nanoscience and Nanotechnology. And now, in the future, you'll be back in Berlin. Yeah. But um, today, he will present on uh, photodynamics and suspended and strained and patterned nanostructures. So please join me in welcoming Marcus. Yeah, thank you very much, André, for the chance to speak here, for the invitation, and uh, thanks you for coming. Um, so, as André already said, I would like to speak a little bit about phonon dynamics and phonon properties, and also some thermal properties in suspended, strained, and patterned nanostructure. And uh, this work uh, was mainly done in the, w in the group of Clivia Sotomayor Torres, uh, who's a group leader at the Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology in Barcelona. Um, so let me start by giving you a small motivation why we're actually looking at these kind of uh, phononic properties. So the idea would be that you want to study different materials that you can use to tune the hypersonic, that means hyperacoustic, and thermal properties in suspended nanostructures. And in the next 40-45 minutes, I would like to basically focus on four examples uh, which we can use to tune these kind of gigahertz and terahertz phononic properties. So the one is uh, the case of ultra-thin silicon membranes. In this case, I would like to address the effects that you can see when you go to very, very thin structures and how this is affecting uh, hypersonic and thermal properties. The next thing is what happens actually when you're introducing a periodic structure. So um, we take one of these silicon membranes and by regular hole patterning, you generate something that is called a 2D phononic crystal in analogy to the photonic crystals. The other aspect that I would like to briefly address is what kind of influence on thermal properties do we see if we consider roughness and also if we consider that there's a native oxide layer on these kind of structures because it turns out that there's something going on and I would like to briefly show some recent results. And finally, I would also like to address um, the effects that are happening with the phonon lifetime when we are highly straining these kind of suspended structures. So um, during this talk, I will mainly focus on three different uh, experimental techniques. Um, if you're coming from Siri, I'm sure that will be a very nice uh, extension of uh, our work because um, this is all experimental work. So one of the um, works will be brilliant light scattering. That is an inelastic light scattering, very similar to Raman, light sc uh, Raman scattering. However, in Raman, we are looking at the uh, optical phonons, and here we are looking at the acoustic phonons. So from this, we can get the dispersion relation of the different modes, and I will show you a little bit how this works in detail. The next part is uh, femtosecond pump and probe reflectivity measurements based on an asynchronous optical sampling technique. Um, I will also go a little bit more into the details when we're coming to the, uh, to the slides, but the main idea here is that we are studying the frequencies, the phonon frequencies, and the phonon dynamics, that means the phonon lifetimes of these acoustic um, phonons in kind of suspended nanostructures. And finally, I would like uh, to also introduce you to the concept of Raman thermometry. This is uh, a concept that we developed a little bit further in Barcelona. We call it two-laser Raman thermometry. In classical Raman thermometry, you just use one laser and you need to assume certain boundary conditions. However, here we use a heating laser to generate um, a temperature distribution and then a spatially resolved uh, low energy uh, probe laser by which we can then, by following the temperature dependent Raman shift, measure the heat distribution in such a suspended structure and derive information about the thermal connectivity. So that brings me to the outline. Uh, as I introduced, I would like to focus first on the silicon membranes, phonon dispersion relation, phonon lifetime and thermal conductivity, then basically go to the 2D phononic structures, um, to phononic crystals. Again, we are looking at dispersion relation, dynamics and thermal conductivity, and also at the influence of roughness and disorder. And uh, then finally, um, I would like to address the influence of the native oxide and uh, the roughness on the thermal conductivity, and then we 
come to the tuning of lifetimes in strained nanostructures. Okay, so let's get started with the membranes. And first we look at the dispersion relation. So if you look at the case for silicon, this is of course known since the last 50 years or so. Um, this is a dispersion relation. And if we're focusing at the range near the gamma point, uh, what you can basically see is um, here the optical modes and then the uh, acoustic modes. And if you are looking um, at what kind of techniques you can use in order to measure this, you will find that, for instance, with Raman scattering is a very good technique to measure these optical phonons, which are typically in the terahertz range, and uh, Brion light scattering can be used to measure the gigahertz acoustic phonons. So if you look now at the center of the, of the Brion zone, uh, you will see that there's usually a linear relation for small wave vectors, and the slope gives you the sound velocity. So the question that I would like to address is what happens if we're going to very thin membranes? What happens to the sound velocity? What happens to the phonon lifetimes? So the bulk waves um, that we know in the bulk case basically turn into lamp waves due to the spatial confinement. And what you can see here is that you see different kind of modes which are giving you an out-of-plane displacement. So that are the flexural modes which are anti-symmetric and the dilatational modes which are symmetric here indicated in, in red and in blue. So the first thing that you see is that the dispersion relation becomes non-linear. And then if you model the phase velocity and the group velocity, uh, it turns out that phase and group velocity are dispersive, they are dissimilar, and that you can even achieve zero and negative group velocities um, in these kind of um, low dimensional freestanding structures. So what we've done now is um, to measure uh, by inelastic light scattering the acoustic phonons. So you see an elastic peak and then you see the transverse and the longitudinal um, acoustical phonons. And by changing the, the angle between um, the scattered light and the surface of your, of your uh, material, you can select certain wave vectors and by tuning this, you can then probe the dispersion relation. So that would be a typical BLS spectrum. You see here the symmetric and the anti-symmetric modes for a 250 nanometer thick silicon membrane. And if you then consider the wave vector for which this was measured, this is here a very small q, then you can see that you just obtain these uh, frequencies. And if you then tune the angle, you can basically probe the dispersion relation in the center, in the center of, this, uh, of the Brioin zone. And we compare this with finite element modeling for the symmetric and the anti-symmetric mode. And you can see that there's an excellent agreement. So you can basically use this technique to measure um, the dispersion relation of the acoustic phonons in this kind of of uh, suspended silicon membranes. One um, interesting aspect that I would like to show you is what happens when we are tuning the thickness um, in these kind of membranes. So um, you can actually see that when you look here at the, um, at the phase velocity for, for these uh, low frequency modes, that when we go to very thin structures, here from 400 nanometers down to eight nanometer thick uh, silicon membranes, that the um, velocity is reduced by a factor of 15 as compared to the bulk. So let's start here from the bulk case. This is for the, um, for the zero order flexural mode. And if we zoom in into this range, plot this on a linear scale, so for very small uh, wave vectors, you can basically see that the phase velocity is re reduced very, very strongly, and that somehow corresponds to slow phonons in these kind of nanostructures. Now, um, this is only the, the flexural mode. However, if you look at the BLS spectrum, you see that the intensity of this mode is around two orders of magnitude larger than the one for the um, symmetric mode. And the question is, um, what do we do with a symmetric mode if we want to monitor this properly? I mean, we can in principle also do this by BLS, but I would like to introduce you now another technique in order to study um, this kind of first order dilatational mode, um, and that is the asynchronous optical sampling. That is basically a time domain technique, and I will show you now how this is working. So we're coming to, to this part. Um, in traditional pump and probe experiments, um, what you're doing is you use a picosecond laser or a femtosecond laser, and then you have a mechanical delay line, and so you're tuning your de delay line, and then you basically uh, probe your time response, and by this you are obtaining a transient by increasing the pass here. However, in uh, asynchronous optical sampling, we use two femtosecond lasers, and these femtosecond lasers are actively stabilized and have a certain frequency offset. So how does it work? Well, in this case, the repetition rate is very high. 
they have a repetition rate of one gigahertz. And um, you can see that there's a certain frequency offset, in this case, 10 kilohertz. That means at t equals zero, you have two pulses, which are coming at the same time. And then they are basically moving apart from each other. And at the end of the time window, they overlap again. That means after 10 kilohertz, uh, one over 10 kilohertz gives you basically 100 microseconds. And that means in 100 microseconds, you can measure the entire time response um, in this window of one nanosecond. So that means the big advantage is you don't need a mechanical delay line. You have very, very good uh, beam pointing stability, good spatial resolution with a time resolution of 50 femtoseconds. And since you can integrate over millions and millions of events, you get very, very nice signal to noise ratio. So how does that look? We take such a system, we are basically exciting a membrane with uh, Titan Sapphire lasers. And what you do is, of course, you generate electron hole pairs. Then you have the typical relaxation mechanisms, um, electron, electron, electron phonon scattering. Uh, that is usually below a picosecond. And then the recombination processes for much more than a picosecond. However, what I would like to focus here on is a process that we are using in order to study the acoustic waves. And this is basically that you have two mechanisms. The one is that you generate a thermal stress due to lattice deformation. And the other one is that you are introducing electronic stress due to the electron hole density that you generate. Um, so it turns out that in silicon, this uh, is roughly seven times larger than the thermal stress. Um, so and, and this kind of um, thermal and electronic stress that you introduce in your system in such a membrane lead to the generation of uh, coherent acoustic phonons. And these phonons are, in the first order, uh, leading to a change in the optical cavity thickness of such a freestanding structure. So the question is, what do we actually measure with this experiment? Well, this is a dispersion relation. And it turns out that uh, we are measuring the first order symmetric mode at the zone center, at the gamma point, for k equals zero. So that means here we are at zero, so this we cannot measure. This is an anti-symmetric mode, which is not leading to any uh, net out-of-plane displacement. And so this is the first mode that we, can give, that we can measure, and that is basically our strongest signal. So what happens is that we introduce a change in the optical cavity thickness and um, by the me mechanical and electronic stress. And since such a membrane behaves like a fabri perot cavity, a uh, change in the thickness corresponds to a change in the reflectivity. And this you can see here from the simulation. And now the thickness change that you introduce by the pump is of the order of a picometer. So it's very, very small. Um, but however, that already gives you a change in reflectivity of the order of 10 to the minus 5. And the system is now sensitive enough to detect these reflectivity changes. And by that, you can um, very precisely measure um, the phonon frequency and also the dynamics. So this is a signal that you're obtaining. In the beginning, you have a fast electronic response. And then you see these kind of small oscillations. Let's zoom in a little bit. So that is actually the signal that we're interested in. And in this case, this is a kind of sinusoidal um, with some higher harmonics. And um, the oscillation of these coherent modes can be described by the change, the relative change in reflectivity, time dependent, is given basically by a sinusoidal function or several sinusoidal functions if you consider higher harmonics and an exponential decay function where omega and tau are the phonon frequency and the, um, and the lifetime of this specific mode. And this is correlated to the thickness of these kind of membranes. So the frequency is basically just given um, by an integer multiplied by the uh, sound velocity divided by two times the thickness. So if you know the sound velocity, it is basically an interferometric method for very precisely measuring your thickness in one local point. And that is also used in the tomography methods, in uh, photoacoustics, or you can determine the sound velocity if you know the thickness. So then, um, Regarding phonon lifetimes in silicon, there were already in 2009 some, some works of uh, Daly in collaboration with a group here from David Cahill. And they measured uh, phonon lifetimes using photoacoustics in bulk silicon uh, using a transducer. And they basically found that this can be nicely modeled by the Archizer model. Um, however, it turns out that if you go to membranes, um, the model overestimates the lifetime of the high frequency phonons. So the idea basically would be to consider, um, this is a work that we have done in, in 2013, um, measure the, 
the dynamics, the phonon dynamics, as function of the thickness for different membranes. And you see that when you go to thinner membranes, of course, your frequency goes higher um, due to the correlation that I just showed before. And you can see that when you go to very thin membranes, that basically the phonon lifetime is, is very strongly reduced. And turns out that the low frequency phonons are dominated by phonon phonon scattering processes, and the high frequency phonons, the lifetime is mainly limited by roughness or by, by boundary scattering processes. So that means that you're getting here in the range of 10 nanometers and in the range of 500 gigahertz or so and in this range the the phonons start to see the roughness and of course um, the the spatial confinement and that is the main uh, limitation to the phonon dynamics in this kind of higher frequency range um, so finally i would like to show you what happens with the thermal properties um, for this we are using this approach of two laser raman summometry um, the concept is quite simple. So uh, what we are doing is basically we use a heating laser. This one is spatially fixed and that generates a temperature distribution. And um, then you use a low power thermometer, which is just uh, a spatially uh, resolved laser that can probe locally the local temperature. And how is this done? This is basically just done by measuring uh, the temperature dependent Raman effect of the optical phonons. So um, if you are getting, if you're far away from the heat, the temperature from the heat pulse, uh, from the heating laser, then the temperature is of course lower. And what you see is a smaller redshift. And when you go closer, the temperature will be higher and you see a broadening and a stronger redshift. And if you then make a temperature calibration, you can directly correlate um, the, the Raman shift to a temperature in each local point. So what you can do is basically to make such a scan and you get a temperature profile for independent heat and probe lasers. And then you can uh, determine the uh, thermal conductivity by uh, Fourier's law for basically a point-like heat source. So you get, when you do a 2D map, you basically get such a plot. And from this plot, um, you see the local temperature. The big advantage in this experiment is basically that you can get temperature-dependent thermal conductivity up to 1000 Kelvin, basically up to the melting point, without the need for making your experiments in a furnace or whatever, by one single scan. So that is actually quite elegant. So for the case of a silicon membrane, in this case 250 nanometer thick, you see that uh, the temperature distribution is isotropic, and this is of course since silicon is also isotropic, and we see that the maximum temperature here was 850 Kelvin. So from this you then derive the thermal conductivity, and uh, we have done that also um, for a range of different thicknesses in the membranes and compared to literature values. And you can see that from the bulk case, starting from uh, 148 watts per meter Kelvin, which is a bulk thermal conductivity, you go down if you extrapolate to one nanometer by almost two orders of magnitude. And actually the, the experiments here, you see the, the errors are, are quite small and they're in very nice agreement um, with, with modeling. So that is basically all that I wanted to show you about the bare membranes. And now much more interesting is what happens if we introduce um, a whole lattice. So if we or introduce a second order periodicity. And this we've done in such a phononic crystal. Um, the membrane thickness is 250 nanometers. There's a lattice periodicity of 30 nanometer, uh, 300 nanometer and a whole diameter of 175 nanometers. So again, we start from the, from the BLS, from the acoustic phonon dispersion relation. Uh, this we've seen before in the unpatterned membrane. And so the question is what happens if we introduce this second order periodicity. And you can see that uh, the dispersion relation strongly changes. So um, in this case, we have a very similar wave vector. However, you see that there are many, many more modes appearing. And using finite element modeling, we can now identify the 3D displacement of all these modes. And uh, you can then tune again um, the wave vector and by this probe, uh, the dispersion relation along these high symmetry points, the X point and the M point. And you can see that there's a strong modification um, that there are, um, there's the energy band gap opening, which is a phononic band gap. 
um, very similar to what people are discussing in photonics and the photonic band gap materials. And you see also that they are very flat branches appearing, which correspond to very slow phonons because, of course, they are related to the, to the group velocity. And, and finally, the question that I would like to address is what actually happens at the gamma point. Now, because this is um, usually around X and M point. And uh, for this, we are coming back to the ASAPS measurements. And we have measured now um, the time response um, in such a phononic crystal. And you can already see that the time response looks much more complex than in the case of the bare membrane. So if we compare this, the bare membrane was something sinusoidal. Then uh, in an ordered phononic crystal, you see such a complex time response. And in addition, we also have introduced disorder. So the question is, what happens if we disturb disordered lattice by introducing random displacement of the holes from the lattice positions. And what you can basically do is you just make a Fourier transformation of uh, these kind of time domain signals and you can directly obtain the uh, frequency spectrum of the coherent acoustic phonons. So that means that for such a silicon uh, 250 nanometer thick membrane, we see the first, the third, and the fifth, and the higher order um, phonon modes. And you can see that they are basically coherent phonon modes up to 200 gigahertz or, or even higher. However, if you introduce now the second order periodicity, this regular whole lattice, um, and you do the Fourier transformation of this time domain signal, First is that there's a very strong modification of the, of the phonon modes, and you can see the appearance of several sharp um, coherent phonons in the, in the low frequency range. And in addition, you can see that you're suppressing higher frequency coherent acoustic phonons. So what we've done is uh, using, again, finite element modeling um, to try out if, to see if this matches with the, with the time domain spectroscopy. And you can actually identify the 3D displacement fields. And you see the experimental points here. They are in excellent agreement for the membrane with the, uh, with the calculations. And if you go to the ordered phononic crystals, um, the question is why do we see only nine modes or why do we see exactly nine modes up to 50 gigahertz? And uh, that becomes clear if you consider the out of plane displacement. So um, this technique only measures um, acoustic phonon modes with non-zero out of plane displacement. So in order to understand that, we have basically modeled the uh, 3D displacement fields and you can see that they are up to 50 gigahertz, only nine modes which have non-zero out of plane displacement. And these are exactly the modes which we find in these uh, femtosecond time domain um, spectroscopy experiments. And so that is actually in a very nice agreement. So. The question that we were asking, okay, we see we have a long, we have a lot of modification here in the material uh, in the hypersonic range, um, but what happens with the thermal conductivity? Um, so in order to study that, we go back to the concept of the two laser Raman thermometry. Um, again, we have a fixed heating source. Again, we are basically probing with our low power Raman meter, uh, Raman laser, uh, the temperature distribution. And what we can see is that the um, phononic crystal in the ordered and in the disordered lattice have exactly the same temperature profile. So we are obtaining basically a thermal conductivity of 14 watts per meter Kelvin in both cases. So if we compare this to the um, unpatterned membrane, that was 250 nanometers, that was um, 80 watts per meter Kelvin. And that was perfectly in line with this thickness tendency. So of course we have um, a volume reduction, a mass loss due to the volume reduction to the whole patterning, but this should only account like for a factor of two or so in our um, reduction of thermal conductivity. It's important to stress that um, the ordered and disordered letters, they have exactly the same filling fraction. So we see here a six-fold reduction um, and uh, possible reasons, of course, are uh, the introduction of additional diffusive boundary scattering due to the increase of the surface area and also of the roughness. And one effect that we would like to study or to think about is also what about any kind of coherent effects. So in order to address this issue, we're just going back to the, uh, to the ASAPS measurement. And basically what is tried to indicate here is in, in blue is the range in which we can see um, this coherent acoustic phonon regime. So if we are now considering that our bare membrane has a roughness of around one 
nanometer. And if we introduce now this regular hole patterning, we also introduce a whole wall roughness due to the reactive ion etching process and so on of the range of around seven nanometers. And then finally, that for um, that the displacement, that the disorder that we have in the disordered phononic crystals can be somehow considered also um, as um, as a kind of roughness, because we have 25 nanometers lattice site displacement from the Everest lattice points, we can basically try to plot um, all the coherent acoustic phonon frequencies that we obtain from the ASAPS measurements um, as a function of a characteristic size, which basically includes the different roughness parameters of, on, on this scale. So we've tried to do that here, and what you can see is basically that you see coherent phonons um, up to this point. Again, for the phononic crystals and the disordered letters, you see basically the highest coherent phonons. In addition, We've now plotted um, basically the specularity parameter uh, where we have 1%, 10%, 30 50 and 90% um, specular uh, reflection. And that means, of course, that we have the corresponding 10% here diffusive scattering and going down. And what it turns out that they are basically following a very similar limit. So that means that for a specularity parameter of between 0.3 and 0.5, we're reaching somehow the limit of where we find the highest frequency coherent acoustic phonons in these kind of structures. And um, from this, we are basically deriving some a bit more general criteria. And that is, if you correspond this to the, to the phonon wavelengths, that you can see that for um, phonon wavelengths uh, larger than 25 times the roughness, basically, we are still in the coherent regimes where we are observing all these coherent acoustic phonons. However, if we have a roughness that is um, basically uh, larger than one tenth of the phonon wavelengths, then you can see that we are in the non coherent regime where, where phonon coherence is destroyed. So, that is the attempt to somehow um, describe um, phonon coherence on, on one scale uh, where we consider both roughness and disorder in this kind of phonon and glassy structures. Um, so, another thing that is somehow related with this is the influence of the native oxide. Um, so what we've tried to do here is um, to consider um, roughness and also the influence of the oxide itself, again by ASOPS and two laser Raman sumometry. And uh, this is basically uh, combined with non-equilibrium MD calculations. So let's start with the thermal properties. So we're doing our, our line scans here for a, two, for a 9 nanometer and a 27 nanometer uh, thick membrane. And then what we're basically doing is uh, we take this membrane, we put it in HF in order to reduce the, um, to the oxide layer, put it very fast into a vacuum chamber, measure the thermal conductivity again, and then open the chamber again in order to reoxidize the surface and measure again after six hours. And what turns out is that you start from this case in the 27 nanometer membrane, let's say we have 27 watts per meter Kelvin in the uh, oxide layer membrane. And then we remove, we remove the oxide, the thermal conductivity goes up to 35 watts per meter Kelvin, and after partial reoxidation, we are basically finding the thermal conductivity in, in the middle of these, of these values. And the effect is even more pronounced if we go to very thin structures, like here in, in the case of a 9 nanometer thick membrane. So thermal conductivity depends highly on the native oxide. The removal of the oxide increases the thermal conductivity, and uh, it turns out that the temperature, uh, that the thermal conductivity in this range is temperature independent. Now, uh, we have combined this with MD calculations and also put in some other values that you find from the literature, and I understand this plot is very confusing, so let me just highlight um, the experimental points from, from this measurement, and what you can basically see is here, again, uh, without the oxide, partially oxidized and, and with a full native oxide and you see a very strong reduction in thermal conductivity um, if you have the native oxide for a very thin membrane. However, if you're going to thicker membranes, the effect becomes less and less pronounced. <coughs> well, of course, if you consider that um, thermal phonons Let's just put a number, let's say a terahertz, of course, is a widespread distribution, but uh, for a terahertz would be in the range of, for silicon, like between eight and 10 nanometer would be the phonon wavelengths. So basically this effect becomes very much pronounced when the thermal, uh, when the wavelengths of the thermal phonons is of a similar dimension than the dimensionality of your material. <coughs> 
Um, finally, we have also looked at the phonon dynamics uh, using again the ASOPS approach. And uh, in this case, I just want to very briefly show you um, that we can measure very precisely the thickness of this uh, native oxide. So uh, in the uh, before etching, we find uh, a frequency here of 103 gigahertz that corresponds to a thickness of 41.2 nanometers. After etching, the frequency goes up. So basically, the, the oxide reduces the thickness by 2.1 nanometer. And the other thing that you see is that the lifetime in both cases is the same. So apparently, um, the presence of the native oxide is strongly affecting the thermal properties, however, is not affecting the dynamics of the gigahertz phonons. Um, so what you can do is basically you can follow the reoxidation dynamics. We've done this here for the native oxide. We start from 500 picoseconds uh, acoustic phonon lifetime. Um, we remove the oxide, you get the same value. And what you can see then is when you open the vacuum chamber and start the oxidation process, <coughs> that you have a very strong surface modification due to the reoxidation process that leads to a strong dampening, which effectively here is expressed by a reduction of lifetime. And then uh, as the surface reoxidizes, you see that um, the dynamics is basically the lifetime increases. And after a couple of hours, we are basically uh, reapproaching the original value as we have obtained before etching. So you can in real time monitor the reoxidation dynamics by this kind of approach. Um, so the surface roughness, let me conclude this again, is not decisive for um, the lifetime of this first order dilatation mode that we are measuring with the um, time domain um, ASOPS technique. So that brings me to the, to the last part already. Um, and that is basically, uh, I would like to show you some work in progress in the moment. There's still a lot of open questions and um, Andre and uh, his people are helping there a lot because we want to find some, some modeling. So um, this is to be taken with care because we still have a lot of open questions. But anyway, I would like to show you this. Um, so what we're doing now is basically studying the influence of um, the uh, of strain of uniaxial strain and suspended nanostructures on the phonon lifetimes of these kind of acoustic modes. Um, so the structures that we're investigating here are uh, MBE grown germanium on silicon and then using um, lithography, reactive ion etching and wet etching, basically the uh, certain region is under etched. So what we are getting is, um, the contrast is not so good, but I hope you can see that it's basically a freestanding structure where in the middle there's a very tiny bridge. And all this area below is basically under etched. And this is grown at a high temperature. And when you go back to room temperature, the different thermal expansion coefficients of silicon and germanium are leading to a, to a strain in this kind of layers. And when you release the structure due to the under etching, the entire strain is concentrated in this neck region. That means that you can basically achieve, using this approach, a very high uniaxial strain. Of course, the original motivation was to make germanium a direct semiconductor. That should happen above 4% or so. Uh, but in this case, I would like to focus only on the, on the phonon dynamics. So what we did is basically to measure the strain at the position of this kind of bridge region. And that we've done just by the Raman shift, uh, considering the strain shift coefficient. And what you can see is basically here an unstrained bridge, a broken bridge, they basically have the relaxed value and then the redshift due to the strain in this kind of strained materials. So then we have, on the other hand, measured for each of these bridges the um, first order dilatation mode phonon lifetime. And it turns out that if you start from uh, zero strain, you obtain like a lifetime in these kind of structures. That depends, of course, of the thickness of the structure. In this case, we have 70 nanometers um, of around 200 to 250 nanometers, uh, sorry, picoseconds. And if you're increasing the strain, um, you basically see that there's a reduction of two or three. And this is uh, an effect which we still do not have completely understood. And I would like to show you like a few <coughs> examples of how we try to understand this a little bit better. So this is basically measurements for a lot of different devices. For all of them measured the strain and for all of them measured the lifetimes. And there's a general trend that with increasing uh, strain, the phonon lifetime goes down. 
So the question was, what happens as a function of temperature? So we did temperature dependent measurements between 300K and 7.5K for a very low strained, initially strained bridge and a rather high initially strained bridge. And what you can see is that for the low strained case, the phonon lifetime remains basically constant. There's only very small reduction. However, for the highly strained case, the phonon lifetime gets much more reduced when we decrease um, the temperature. So let's plot this together. You see this here again. The low strain case, the lifetime changes by 20 picoseconds. The high strain case, the lifetime changes almost by a factor of two. So the question was, of course, how is strain affecting the temperature? Is this a pure temperature effect? Is this a pure strain effect? Or is this a combined effect? So in order to address this, we have measured temperature dependent uh, the, the strain evolution um, for these three cases, low, medium, and high. And since we are using the different thermal expansion coefficients of the two materials, um, if we are reducing the temperature further, it is only normal to expect that uh, the higher initially strained uh, materials is increasing the strain even higher because you're going further away from the growth condition. And this is exactly what happens. So if we have a higher initial strain and we reduce the temperature further, we see a larger modification in the larger increase in the strain than in the initial case. So let's try to put this together. Um, we have seen the phonon lifetime dependence as function of strain. We have seen uh, the increase of strain uh, when we reduce the temperature. And we've also seen the phonon lifetime dependence as function of temperature. So this is basically the general trend. So let me try to walk you through this. So let's start by at room temperature for a low strain case that gives you uh, a reduction lifetime uh, which is also very small and if we're just plotting the vector in this in this general diagram you can you can get basically such a vector here now we take a medium strain case we plot the strain change and the uh, lifetime change starting from this initial point and we get again such a vector and we do the same for the high strain case so what turns out is that the temperature is the phonon lifetime is exclusively governed by the change in the strain, that means the initial strain and the temperature dependent strain, and there's no strain independent temperature dependence. So that, let's, let's summarize this again. So the temperature itself is not affecting the phonon lifetime, it's only affecting it indirectly due to the increase of the strain. Because you can basically see that all the temperature dependence um, is perfectly reproduced by the increase in the strain and that per perfectly follows the initial, um, the initial room temperature dependence of the phonon lifetime as function of strain. So this was the idea in order to exclude basically a temperature contribution to uh, the modification of the lifetime. So um, what happens with the phonon frequency? This is the very last thing I want to show you. So we did some finite element modeling for such a germanium bridge for the zero uh, GPA and three GPA. And now let's zoom in at this kind of uh, center of the Brion zone. And the mode that we are looking at is actually here, this first oral dilatation mode. What you can see is that you expect a slight decrease in uh, phonon frequency um, when you increase the the stress in this case and uh, we have measured this again over lots of different events and it turns out that the reduction in the frequency is um, very well reproduced by the finite element modeling. This is still not giving us any information about the of the lifetime change. So the open questions, the to-dos would be what is the dominant decay mechanism of this mode, what is the origin of the phonon lifetime reduction with increasing strain and one idea would be that we are following up here on some up initial calculations of the phonon lifetime in order to get some insight into these processes and how the strain is reducing our lifetime here so much. So with that, I would like to summarize. Um, so we've started basically from the membranes. We've seen that light scattering techniques can be used to probe the hypersonic and the heat transport in uh, suspended nanostructures. I've shown you that the phonon dispersion can be tuned by periodic hole patterning uh, and that you can generate phononic band gaps. We've introduced ASOPs as a time domain technique to study coherent phonons in, in membranes and phononic crystals. 
We've also seen that two laser Raman thermometry can be used to measure the temperature dependence of the thermal conductivity up to the melting point without the need of any furnace or additional boundary conditions. We've seen that roughness and disorder destroy high frequency phonon coherence as probed by the coherent acoustic phonons in this time domain spectroscopy approach. And we've also seen that there's no influence of disorder on the room temperature thermal conductivity in uh, these ordered and disordered phononic crystals. Um, and also that you can somehow define a coherent phonon regime as function of the roughness. On the other hand, we've seen that uh, thermal conductivity in syn membranes is affected very much by roughness and the native oxide layer um, that you can measure the acoustic phonon lifetimes independent of um, the native oxide layer. So that is basically explained by the fact that these are gigahertz phonons and the other ones are basically uh, terahertz phonons, the thermal phonons. So you have very different wavelengths and of course you would expect that they differently respond to one nanometer of surface roughness. We have seen that we can follow the oxidation dynamics in real time uh, studied by ASOPS. Uh, then I've showed you the fabrication of these kind of highly strained germanium bridges um, with strain values up to 3.2%. And we've seen this strong reduction of the coherent acoustic phonon lifetime with increasing uniaxial strain. And uh, they follow basically very nicely the, the frequency dependence. And currently we're trying to understand this kind of uh, lifetime dependence. And uh, with that, I would like to thank all the co-workers, especially in the group of Clivia Sotomayor Torres. Um, the germanium bridges were fabricated at the uh, Material Science uh, Institute in Barcelona, and the membrane work is done in collaboration with VTT in Finland. These are some of our recent references, and of course, thanks to the funding partners, and thank you very much for being here. Yeah, so this, uh, this is, uh, you need to take into account because as we've seen, you have both temperature dependent Raman shifts and strain dependent Raman shifts um, so that, that you can basically very easily take out if you make a power series and you follow up on the local heating that you get so then you can see what is the dependence and um, you need to make a proper calibration. So what we usually do is we put the sample into a, a cryostat. If it's a material that we don't know yet, for silicon this is no problem. We make a temperature dependence, we model we, or we measure the temperature dependent Raman shift and then you have basically this taken out and then you can uh, follow up. So basically the whole, the, you are calibrating the, the total effect of strain. Yeah, yeah. I, and the other thing that is really important to, to consider is that you need to measure very precisely the absorbed power because this goes into the equation in order to determine the thermal conductivity. So you need to know the absorbed power and this in the beginning was a bit critical because you need to measure the initial, the reflected and the transmitted power and the reflected in such a micro Raman setup is, is a bit critical but it's only a technical detail and if you have all these values you know the absorbed power and um, you know the, uh, the temperature rise, you can basically using Fourier's law for two dimensions with a point like heat source you can directly obtain the temperature dependent thermal conductivity. Sort of follow up on experimental questions. Uh, yeah. um, first, the electron hole plasma also creates a Raman shift. Yeah. So how do you eliminate that? Because the Raman, because the electron hole plasma density is going to vary with surface condition, with you know holes or not holes. Yeah. Lifetimes will vary by orders of magnitude. Yeah. Um, let me think about that. Um, that, that probably depends a lot on the on the uh, mean free pass, no? Because I uh, would need to make the numbers, but I guess that I mean we're looking here at a scale from up to 100 micrometers or so on. I mean they're basically probe the temperature distribution in in these kind of structures. I mean again, it depends on recombination velocity of the yeah. surfaces, whether that electron the carrier propagation and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, in in, in your experience? I've never heard anybody talk about it. Say again? I say, I, I, maybe it's not important, but yeah. I never hear anybody talk about it. Yeah. 
actually, um, from what we've seen, it cannot be a very important effect because all the values that you're getting, they are basically in perfect alignment with literature reports and what you would expect for samples of certain dimensions and so on. So, so you always get what you expect. Why are you doing an experiment? No, I mean, the, the idea is that you can basically use this for any kind of free stringing structures. No? I mean, for silicon, this is a reference system because it's very well studied. But you can basically apply this to any kind of material that gives you a temperature-dependent Raman shift. And, and that is that is a nice approach because, of course, there are a lot of thermometry works. And initially, I mean, there's the works from Baladin and Graphene and so on, which are highly yeah, cited. I think it's a good point to consider this, but but I think there's main, one main advantage, and this well, is. You know, Balladin's work is highly cited and wrong. And wrong, exactly, and that is wrong, exactly, because because the problem here, in my opinion, is um, that uh, we they only use one laser. And that means that you need to assume certain boundary conditions. And the boundary condition here would be, uh, I mean, OK, we can go into the, yeah, but I mean, the, the nice approach here is um, that you don't need to assume boundary conditions because you're basically using an independent heating and probing laser. But I, I think we need to consider also this. I mean, this is a fair question. Yeah. So you study out the oxidation effects on thermal conductivity. When you re the surface, Roughness between the samples, or as it is evolving in time, is not the same. How do you distinguish between the effect of roughness and the effect of oxide? They are attributing everything to the oxide. Yeah. Um, the roughness is um, actually we did the process several times. So what happens is basically that you're etching, then you're reoxidizing. That takes actually longer than six hours in order to get full surface reconstruction and then you do it again and it turns out that this is rather producible and the question is would you really expect that you have the same roughness after the first and after the second etching I would not expect this because usually the etching is quite violent so um, well we measured this like two or three times now I mean the roughness um, the problem is to measure with AFM, for instance, a uh, 9 nanometer thick membrane is highly sensitive. So this is not really working. But of course, you can measure uh, in the non-free standing area. So I didn't show the data, but we measured the roughness. And it turns out that, um, that if you reproduce the process, you're, you were changing somehow the roughness, but it was not in a, in a significant range. I mean. The, the reduction of thermal or the increase of thermal conductivity when you remove the oxide layer and then um, coming back to basically the value in the reoxidized um, sample that was reproducible. It brings me back to your, the earlier data you showed of the uh, comparison of uh, lifetimes mm -hmm. with the thickness of the membrane where you attribute the deviation from the Kaiser to Mm -hmm. But then again, over there, the thinner membranes are typically rougher than the thicker membranes. Relative to their total thickness. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. is that a fair comparison? Yeah, you know, if you ask me seriously about the inference of roughness, I have the feeling that there's there would still need to, there is still like a good motivation for, for a very proper study uh, where you quantify exactly the effects of roughness because of course this will, in my opinion, depend a lot on the, on the wavelengths of the phonons that you're looking at. And as far as I know, there are not many studies or maybe none at all which are making a very, very uh, controlled study of the roughness and the, the thermal and, and the acoustic um, properties. The problem, of course, is like introducing a very controlled roughness series is not so straightforward from the material science point of view. So, but I, if you feel like doing that, I think uh, the community will be happy. <laughs> no, it's a very good point. Yeah. Let me ask one also. Um, yeah. So, is it very well known whether the reduction of the lifetime with, with increasing strain, whether that is an effect that happens in bulk materials as well? Or is it something that happens really only in the nanomaterials, like the nano bridges, for example? So would that be something to expect also for bulk, straight bulk? I don't know. Okay. I so it's not, nobody has ever looked no, at no. something? Because, because um, there's one point, um, and this is basically, oh no, this disappeared already. Uh, let me see. 
Um, so basically, this mode that we are measuring here, um, this mode is, n sorry, let me go back here. This you will not find in bulk material. I mean, you can, uh, you can measure other phonons, of course, uh, or you can use uh, transducers and, and things like that. Why do I have this? Ah, you mean this here, no? So, so basically, um, yeah, okay, because we, we are looking at this kind of modes. And, and uh, this kind of mode is basically a mode that needs a change in the optical cavity thickness. So this you will not, this will, this will you not see in bulk material. But, but uh, of course you can use uh, transducers, and then you can like, um, like the group of David Cahill did, and already here, as I said, in 2009, using a transducer and then looking for bulk silicon, measuring the phonon lifetimes, and so on. And, and, and that, is, that, is in principle, that is in principle possible, but I'm not sure how largely you can strain also yeah, bulk material, so strain because, sure. because you, you would need, I mean, you can probably put it in a hydrostatic pressure cell, and you can put a lot of hydrostatic pressure, but... Yeah, I would expect that scene. I mean, you know, I mean, the, this Akhizer mechanism kind of thing is also very temperature. See, don't see any temperature dependence. That's not this. Yeah. Yeah. So the mechanism. I don't. Not clearly what the mechanism is. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Experimental question. <laughs> so in the in your Raman measurement with the two probes. Yeah. So if I understand correct, we showed a very large temperature difference within the limit. So you're heating it to like 800 Kelvin. Yeah. How do you extract the conduct? So you're extracting all the conductivity data from one. So that that is basically that will be basically something like this. Yeah. So basically. No, you basically obtain um, the temperature dependent thermal conductivity, because what you can do is, I mean, it turns out, for instance, I didn't show all this, but it turns out that when you're going to a very, very thin membrane that uh, your thermal conductivity is basically temperature is, is basically constant. The temperature dependent thermal conductivity is basically constant. However, if you go to a thicker material, you basically find um, a kind of bending. And if you look now um, at a very, very old work in silicon, uh, glass, Brenner and, and slack, they've done this in 64. They basically found this kind of uh, temperature dependent uh, thermal conductivity or thin and basically, we plot this here just on, on this, um, on this basically so spatial. How do you go from temperature to ah, ah, th this is basically done here. So you're you're using Fourier's law. You assume um, you you yeah. reduce this. You re yeah. No, I think you, I mean, this is, this is not directly my work, so I'm not the expert, but uh, as far as I understand, you don't need to do this because you're basically assuming a point like heat source, I mean, far away. I mean, you are, of course, you have a Gaussian laser spot, but you're not considering. It has to be done iteratively in some way. Right? It has to be done iteratively in some way. Right? Oh, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. So you have to converge yeah. it. I mean, for for relatively small temperature changes, you don't care because in this case yeah. it's it's linear. And for very thin membranes, we also don't care. For larger membranes, actually, what you see is that you have this nonlinearity. And um, and as far as I as far as I remember, basically from basic plotting this on this logarithmic scale on on the distance from the heating spot, you can just use. Um, uh, this kind of, actually you see this in this expression. I mean, I'm, yeah, you, so ca you can see that this is becoming linear. The form of thermal yeah, conductivity is? Temperature dependence on the path and the expression for what the variation of conductivity with temperature is. If I know that, then it's a matter of finding the constants. I think it's not yeah. quite that. I think it's, you determine locally, you determine the thermal conductivity from the slope of that. Yeah. And then you have to sort of integrate it back to find out what temperature yeah. was there. It's not, it's, it's, you just 
determine the local. Yeah. No, actually, you, mean, you, mean, you mean, No, but you don't know what temperature you're at. You just know that yeah. this slope says at this location the thermal conductivity is this. Yeah, exactly. And then you know the thermal conductivity everywhere, and then you can work back to get the temperature. Yeah. You integrate that. Exactly. So that, that is basically here a small interval, and you do this for the entire curve. and.